Hey everybody, I'm Aaron, and this video is part of a series that I'm helping produce for Overthink on the philosophies of history and memory. This is our extended interview with Professor of Philosophy at Occidental College, Robert Eli Sanchez. He is the co-editor of the book, Mexican Philosophy in the 20th Century, Essential Readings from Oxford University Press, as well as the editor of the book, Latin American and Latinx Philosophy, a Collaborative Introduction. He's the managing editor of the Journal of Mexican Philosophy, and he's currently completing a critical introduction to the philosophy of the Mexican humanist, Samuel Ramos. In the following conversation, we discuss the philosophical canon with him, and we draw from a recent article of his, which we linked below. We really, really hope you enjoy this as much as we did making it. In the description, you'll find a link to Sanchez's blog, as well as other reading recommendations from us, including his work and others to explore more in the topic and field, and also a link to a video essay that we produced, including snippets from this interview. Okay, enjoy. First of all, thank you for being here. Thank you for coming. Really excited about this interview. So in your recent article, Reimagining the Canon Through Mexican Philosophy, you argue that the philosophical canon as it exists has issues, but it's worth fighting over in a sense. Could you tell us a little bit more about what the philosophical canon is in the first place and what the problem of representation, as you put it, might be? Right. So um, I think, I mean, so it's, it's a big question and, uh, you know, there, I think there's a historical etymo etymological answer to the question. Um, but I think in sort of like a colloquial sense of what we mean by canon is something like uh, a list of compositions, texts or, or works, works of art uh, that define a standard of excellence. And anyone who wants to contribute to that tradition or art ought to be familiar with this standard. Right. So you know, sometimes you hear it referred to as the creme de la creme, the, the mighty dead. Right. These are the best examples of whatever tradition you're talking about. So in philosophy, the idea is that there's some definition of what philosophy is. And there are certain exemplary figures who um, who define what it is to do it really, really well. Um, and so if you want to be a philosopher, if you want to contribute to the history of philosophy, if you want to critique philosophy, you want to be a student of philosophy, these are the figures you ought to be familiar with. Part of what the conversation about the canon is all about is trying to figure out how to reimagine, how to think about what a canon is in order to make it more inclusive and more representative. Um, and so the problem of representation is just, I mean, it's just the idea that the canon, as it is, does not adequately represent non Dwems, so non-dead white European males, right? And it's problematic for a couple of reasons. One is it's a form of epistemic injustice. And so that's, I mean, we can get into that. That's a whole conversation. Um, but also, and I think just as importantly, I think we'd end up with a really different picture of what philosophy is if we took seriously right, these other traditions or figures from these other traditions or what are either considered canonical texts in these other traditions or ought to be considered canonical texts in these other traditions. So part of your analysis of what the problem is, is that there are sort of, uh, there are different approaches to what to do about it, right? And one approach that might be popular um, or like immediately graspable for people as well. You just add more to the canon, right? You add more um, non-dead white European males to intro to philosophy curriculum, and that might help solve this problem of representation. Um, could you talk a little bit about maybe in your view why that doesn't do enough? So first of all, I should say that is part of the solution, right? We have to make syllabi more inclusive. We have to make the curricula more inclusive, more diverse, and we need to to provide support, to give us the resources to be able to do that. And so I think all of that is absolutely essential. Why isn't it enough? Um, I'm worried about the structure of exclusion. I mean, so on the one hand, you hear a lot, a lot of scholars today talking about the way in which philosophy is sexist and racist and elitist and, and hierarchical, and I don't disagree, <laughs> right? Um, but I think there's something about the structure of exclusion that, that makes me worried that adding more voices in and enough because we'll find a way of excluding those voices too. Or we'll find a way of putting them off until later. Or we'll find a way of adding them to the list, but at the very top of the list or 
the very bottom of the list uh, where, you know, it, it's a long time before we get to them. And so I think we should focus on the structure of exclusion and figure out why certain figures are excluded and why we ought to think they're wrongly excluded. I think it might be important um, to talk a little bit about a concept that you use in the essay really centrally towards the end of the essay, um, which is the, the concept of accidentality and how accidentality might be sort of a central uh, idea or framing with which to do this reimagining of the canon. Um, do you think you could tell us a little bit about what accidentality is as a philosophical concept? Um, <laughs> and then what, how, what you might be doing with it in your project. Yeah, sure. Um, so that's tough. <laughs> I mean, look, if, uh, so first of all, the term, the, the concept accidentality, uh, we attribute it to a uh, Mexican philosopher, Emilio Uranga, from the mid-century, uh, mid-century Mexican philosophy. It's developed in, in a text that now is translated into English called The Analysis of Mexican Being. Um, and so if you're interested in really exploring this, that's, that's a good place to start. If we really want to fully appreciate the concept of accidentality, we got to go back to scholastic metaphysics and the distinction between substance and accident. What Uranga is doing with it, he's sort of responding to Heidegger, for whom uh, substance and accidents is an ontic distinction, right? And he and you know for Heidegger, right? It's a distinction that applies to entities, and it's not an ontological distinction or an ontological category. For Uranga, it's an ontological category, and so it's one that applies to our being, um, right? And so Dasein's being or the Mexican Dasein's being. For Uranga, the great works of philosophy are those that bring us closer to our accidentality, and part of what he means by that are those texts that help us to feel in our bones the fundamental uncertainty of human existence, right? Our fundamental fragility, the contingency of, um, of human existence. And also, and this is, I think, an important part of understanding the role the concept accidentality plays in this larger project of Mexican humanism that I'm working on, um, the way in which it puts us in what he calls the originary position where, where we have to justify our humanity, right? Justify that we're human, right? And he, draw, and, and he points out that this is something that the European philosophers never, or the European tradition has never really had to do, right? So in, in the European tradition, we've, we've spent a lot of time talking about what it means to be human, what defines us as human, what makes human beings special, um, but never really in the position of having to justify that we're human, right? And this is different in the Mexican experience in Mexican history. And so for Uranga, the Mexican is really, uh, or the Mexican really feels, again, in their bones, right? This fundamental sense of having to justify that they're human, right? To be human is to be dependent. It's to be fragile. It's to be insufficient. And this is something that the Mexican is, for Uranga, it's much more attuned to, right, than, than the European. And, you know, um, there's a question about whether this sort of uniquely describes the Mexican or whether the Mexican is just a really good example of it. And when I'm teaching this uh, in class, I often refer to, because we're talking about culture, right? Like, does culture represent, like, these differences between peoples? And, um, and I talk about the movie Coco, right, uh, right, which is this, this Pixar movie for kids and, and you know, my, my daughter's six years old and so I've watched it 72 times. <laughs> um, and then, but you know, as I'm, as I'm thinking about this notion of accidentality and you know, whether, whether it's true, like is it true about Mexicans? This is define Mexican identity. And I'm thinking like, well, you know, we have this movie, this Disney movie for kids that's supposed to help share Mexican culture and what is it about? It's fundamentally about the possibility of being forgotten, right? And death, right? And disappearance and non-existence. And I was thinking on the one hand, I was like, you know, as a parent, I'm thinking like, oh wait, do I wanna introduce my kid to this? <laughs> like, this is like really scary, right? There's that, that point where they're singing that song, 
about being forgotten. Nobody remembers him. And so he's going to fade out of existence. And my kid loves it because it's colorful and it's magical. And this is our culture and this is who we are. And I'm like, yeah, that is how we think about things, right? And so I'm thinking like, you know, there is something representative here about Mexican culture. And this is what I think Uranga is sort of picking up on. It's something you feel in Mexican society, Mexican culture, Mexican history, right? This threat of being forgotten. Um, and this is what I think Uranga, and I, I think I want to say too, is what all really good works of philosophy do to us. They put us in the position of feeling deep down our fundamental and accidentality. Right. So in your essay, you talk about the major figure of Western philosophy, Descartes, mm -hmm. and how even him as sort of the canonical dead white European male. Yeah engages in a way in helping us feel this project of accidentality and how for that reason and that fact that he's so successful at it in a way it deserves to be counted among the canon mm -hmm. um i want to push that a bit forward and ask how far accidentality goes because if uranga is right and this really is an ontological and not ontic condition then you should be able to find it in almost any text yeah you know and so the question is why is it important to uphold at least a canon that has some resemblance to the current one, as opposed to just completely shifting gears and thinking exclusively about um, people who have been marginal to the story of the West, to thinking about like the Fanons and the Nezahualcoyotls and the Urangas? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. And there is a worry that in defending some notion of canonicity, we're just preserving the dwems. Um, and that's not what I want to say, right? Um, and I don't think everyone is gonna is gonna make the cut in the end, right? I don't think all the all the dwems are gonna make the cut in the end. But I do think that there's something great about the Plato's and the Descartes and the Kants. So I want to say two things. I want to say one that what's great about them is different from what we typically attribute to them, and two that there there's a totally different way of reading them, right? And so if you look at someone like Descartes, who is as canonical as they get, right? Um, and as actually is the, if you are immersed in Uranga, right? You, and, and you understand the difference between substance and, and accidentality, you would say is like the paradigm example of a substantial philosopher, someone who's pushing substance, right? As the defining feature of human existence, because he calls us thinking things, right? And the notion of thing is, 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 smack dab in the middle of what uh, the Western tradition understands as substance. But I, what I want to say is, if you immerse yourself in these other marginalized traditions, and if you really cozy up to the Urangas and the Netzawalcoyotes, um, you'll see De even someone like Descartes in a different light. And so in the essay, what I do is, I mean, I say, look, look at what he's doing. I said, yes, he defines what it means to be human. And he says, look, I'm going to do it from scratch. Right? So I'm not going to just uh, assume that, that uh, Aristotle was right and that we're rational creatures. Right? I'm going to say, I'm going to try to figure out for myself what it is. And he tells us, I, or, he, or he, said, he tells himself, I am, I exist. Right? And I think, look, that's a good starting point. And it could be the beginning of something like foundationalism right, in epistemology or, or some other ism. Right? But what I want to focus on is why did he feel the need to prove that he exists, right? Like why is the very fact of his existence, right, an axiom of his first philosophy, right? And so it's this, again, it's going back to this notion of accidentality where, you know, he's in a position of having to prove that he exists, that he's human. Right. And then and then building from there. And so that's that radical uncertainty that I'm talking about. And so in the, in the essay, I give some examples about the world in which Descartes inhabited. And I said, look how crazy this world is. Everything was up for grabs. And I mentioned, right, this this poem by John Donne, which was written like a few decades before. And Donne d describes it perfectly where everything is lost. Everything is up in the air. Everything is in in chaos every every right the, the the ground is given away and so what i'm saying here is there's a whole different way of reading descartes that i think we'll appreciate uh if we are 
familiar with these marginalized figures. And so I think we should start there, right, to come back to these figures to ask whether they still make the cut. What I'm not saying is, look, Plato's, Descartes, Kant's, they're great. We'll keep them. And then we'll also see who else we can add. I say we need to reimagine what the canon is, which means we need to reimagine what philosophy is, right? And I think this notion of accidentality and the idea of realizing our full human potential, as I, as I describe it in the, in the essay, is a good place to start. And I think that's something that we'll learn to appreciate more by paying more attention or taking much more seriously these marginalized figures because they're speaking from a position of marginality. And this is the position that I think Uranga identifies as the reason why the Mexican is really attuned to their accidentality because of this historical marginalization. I want to say, if we look at these other figures, when we come back to someone like Descartes, we might see them in a very different light. A quote that you hear very often in philosophy that gets thrown around a lot is that the history of Western philosophy is a series of footnotes to Plato. Mm -hmm. um, and the work you're doing as in shifting who is at the center, right? And no longer it is Plato just because of the fact that he is Plato, mm -hmm. but rather because of the merits of their work measured on the scale of accidentality. Mm -hmm. um, it sort of throws into question a vision like this genealogical, like single tree line that just goes all the way back. How does your work sort of both take up issue with this idea of a single coherent storyline mm -hmm. um, while also thinking through these questions of like um, genealogy and traditions and schools that in a way still persist? Hmm? Yeah, right. Um, yeah, and so sometimes you hear when, when you when you hear someone critiquing or asking this question about this one track genealogy um, and they say, well, you know, what's wrong with it? Like, isn't it the case that in order to fully understand Aquinas, uh, you, you should really know your Aristotle. Right. And I think I think the, the, re the response is if we're critiquing it um, is just that it's it's one track. Right. And so um, it's one thing to say. In order to fully appreciate Aquinas and his project, you should really know your Aristotle. And, it, and that's probably right. Um, it's another thing to say to fully appreciate both of them, right? And the, tr the, the tradition and the genealogy and the development of that tradition. Um, you need some contrast, right? So I actually, I liken it a lot to speaking one language, right? Um, and I think that the best thing about learning another language, I mean, of course, it helps you to immerse yourself in another culture and it gives you a, a whole different world that you can explore. And th that's all great. But for me, I mean, I remember this when I when I was studying Latin at Pomona College. One of the great things about learning another language is the way it gets you to look at your own language differently. Right. So all of a sudden, when you're studying a different language, you notice certain things about your language, whether words light up in a different way or the structure of a sentence. And all of a sudden you're you're aware, you're self-aware. Right. And so you need that contrast to be self-aware. And I think that's what's missing from this one sided or this one track genealogy is this self-awareness that you get by having contrast. Right. And so let me give you an example. In the 1940s, Mexican philosophers were asking the question, whether the Aztecs, the Nahua, uh, did philosophy. And most philosophers at the time answered in the negative. They were like, no, it wasn't really philosophy. They had, sure, they had a sophisticated worldview and, and, and political organization and, uh, and uh, this political scheme, uh, regime. And so, right, they're very sophisticated people, but it, it didn't really amount to philosophy. Then along comes this guy named Miguel Leon Portilla, who famously sort of makes the case that, in fact, the Aztecs do have philosophy. When the text, so it's kind of a side note, but when the text is translated into English, it's translated as Aztec thought and culture, right? Not Nahuatl, la filosofía Nahuatl, which, you know, which has philosophy in the title, because there was this question, this critique about, well, is it really philosophy? And Leon Portilla answers 
Yes. So he's one of the first that answers in the affirmative, right? He says, yes, they do have philosophy. But the question is, how does he do it? So what he does is, you know, early in the book, he says, look, philosophy is really hard to define. There's lots of different definitions, etc." He says, but here's like sort of a rough picture based in this Greek model. And he says, so here's what philosophy is. Here's what the Greeks did. And look, the Aztecs did that too. Right? And I, I think of that as a missed opportunity. Like, I'm mad. I, you know, and I, told, I met him once. I told him this. I was like, why didn't you go the other way? You could have gone the other way around. You could have said, look, here's a completely different way of doing things. It's really cool. It's really sophisticated. You might be super excited about it, especially because it's so unfamiliar. Right? Let's take this seriously because it might turn the question around and put us in the position of asking about our own tradition, whether we do philosophy. Now that just sounds like an absurd question, right? Like, of course we do philosophy, right? We invented philosophy. The Greeks invented philosophy. Philosophy just is this tradition. And what I wanna say, going back to this notion of accidentality, you're not really doing philosophy if you're not in a position to really ask about your own tradition, your own way of doing things, whether this is philosophy in the way that you ask that about another tradition, right? And so what I would have really loved is for it to have gone the other way around. And, and the idea is, going back to the original question is, that's not something you can do unless you're fully immersed in another tradition. Sure, just ask. <laughs> <laughs> Siri's got it. Yeah, you should. Yeah, just ask. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go back now a little bit um, to the structures of exclusion that you mentioned earlier, um, and and specifically the idea that even if there are efforts to be made to include, that doesn't always necessarily mean it's going to be done right. An example that um, I'm thinking of is. Um, Hegel, Susan Buck Morris, um, has argued that uh, Hegel's writing, you know, maybe his most famous um, idea, the master-slave dialectic, he's writing this at the time of the Haitian Revolution, and he's aware of it. And so what she argues is that this entire history, which is part of Hegel's history, is excluded. It's written off as not part of the history. And so you talk about philosophical imperialism and how dehumanization is a part of that process of excluding that that structure of exclusion that you yeah. mentioned earlier. Um, so yeah, could you just tell us a little bit about what that dehumanization is yeah. and how it plays into why some things can't just be included? Yeah, um, it's good and it's scary and it's sort of insidious, right? It's, um, it's like a neat trick. One way to approach it is to critique the canon and the history of philosophy, right? So not just the canon, not just the major text, the mighty dead, um, but also the way, we, the way we tell the history of philosophy. Um, one way to critique it is to say, look, you got a bunch of sexist people, a bunch of racist people, and we have sort of willfully ignored and excluded, right, these influences and these contributions. And again, I think there's a lot of that, and I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to suggest in any way that those aren't also operative. Um, but I do say that there's something else going on, and I think maybe even more fundamentally, or maybe this is just uh, an extension of, or the way racism and sexism and the other forms of chauvinism and exclusion work, is uh, this, this notion of imperialism that I develop and I attribute to these Mexican philosophers. And the way that it works is, for the most part, Western philosophers are ignorant of other traditions and major figures of other traditions and the influences of, like in this case, the Haitian Revolution on, on Hegel. But more to the point, we have found a way of justifying our ignorance. And we found a way of justifying our ignorance a priori. And so this is what I mean by the neat trick, right? So we tell ourselves that philosophy is universal in scope and method Right, and so in both in scope and in method, and and so what we mean is in part is that philosophy, 
treats themes or asks questions of universal scope, right? So questions like, does God exist? Uh, what is the universe made of, uh, right? Uh, so these are, these are questions whose truths are universal. And you hear people like Russell talking about, uh, right, maximally general truths or describing the universe, right? It's not only that we think of uh, Western philosophy as universal, we think of the, universe, the universality of philosophy as being a unique contribution of Western philosophy. And so here's the trick. When you ask about the influence of the Haitian Revolution, or when you look at a tradition like Latin American philosophy or Islamic philosophy or, or whatever, uh, the immediate question is, well, is there something different about it? Right? Is there something particular, something unique? And I get this, I've, well, I, I still get the question, but I used to get the question 10, 15 years ago all the time. And it was really just the way of discounting the value and the existence of something like Latin American philosophy. So, well, what is it? Is it, you know, is it different? Like, sh should I take it seriously because it's different? But here's the trick, right? To the extent that it's different, to the extent that it represents a culture, to the, rep to the extent that it represents a history, to the extent that it's a particular tradition, right? It's automatically discounted from being, from being philosophy by definition because it's not universal. Right. Or if you ask about the Haitian influence on Hegel, well, that doesn't matter because now you're looking for the genealogy of ideas. And that's a way of historicizing philosophy. But philosophy as universal is ahistorical. Otherness is counted as particularity and particularity is counted as not universal. Of course, there's always an element of inferiority tied to this notion of particularity because we esteem universality. Right. But it's again the imperialism has the structure of not only are we ignorant, but we can find a way of maintaining our ignorance a priori. Anything that seeks recognition as different doesn't count. You talk about moving outside of a history of philosophy towards a histories of philosophy, one that no longer arrogates to itself the power to claim universality and in a way that embraces the cultural plurality of, of what philosophy can be, you know, and it refuses to start from a single center. Um, and so thinking through these marginal figures is helpful at allowing us to begin to move beyond this exclusion. Um, but the canon you emphasize is a sort of a living, breathing thing, and like it changes, and it's it's really impossible to like petrify it into a single line. It's always going to be updating and changing, and so. An important part of this forward step is to recognize it as a canon and to say, well, this is our archive. You know, this is our living um, histories of philosophy, and that's how we have to treat them. And so I wonder how you would frame this engagement with, with these histories of philosophy and how they take place in the present. So I, 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 think, I think you're absolutely right. And I don't think anyone's goal here is to arrive at the canon. Part of what Uranga is trying to get us to see by the, through this notion of accidentality is that, there, that no one tradition, not our tradition, not any tradition, is the tradition. And I think, so part of, I think part of your question is, how do we move past this exclusion? How do we reimagine the canon in a way that moves us forward, right? And so... I think one notion is to start rethinking the notion of canonicity in terms of the, right, the canon, right, as a singular, static, right, immovable, unreimaginable thing. And so, like you said, I'm really emphasizing histories in the plural. Um, and the thing about that is, is you can only fully appreciate that if you're fully conversant in more than one tradition, right? If you're, if you, only if you immerse yourself in a tradition that you're unfamiliar with, right? So when I was coming up, um, and I think this is probably still the case, but I'm just not, you know, I'm not in this, at this stage in my career anymore. Uh, we used to complain about having to do double duty, right? And so the thought was, you know, you're, you're coming up in grad school, and if you're really interested in something like Latin American philosophy, you still have to write about something mainstream, 
right, to get a job, to get promoted, to get tenure, and, and so on. And that put us at a huge professional disadvantage. And it was really unjust in lots of ways, but professionally it's really unjust because um, you have to do twice as much work to be able to do the thing that you really care about, right? And so for a long time I lamented, right? Or I don't know, maybe I was even a little resentful about having to do this double duty. But you know, now that I've survived in a sense, I, you know, I, I, I've, I've earned tenure at, at a school I, I, I really like and, and want to stay at, um, my attitude has changed and I've started to realize that it's a professional disadvantage and it's unjust for that reason, but it's a huge philosophical advantage, right? Because, there, because you can't fully appreciate the historicity of philosophy, of philosophical traditions, if you only have one. And there's a, there's a Mexican philosopher, historian, I mean, just all around lettered person, Alfonso Reyes. And he's got an essay, we could put a link to it, um, where he makes the case where he says, you know, um, one of the difficulties of being a Latin American philosopher is that we have to know both traditions. We have to know the Western tradition, we have to know our own, right? And he says, it's really hard because it's a lot to know, and it's a lot to commit to, and it's a lot to really try to immerse yourselves in. But what you get is a richer, fuller story of the potential and possibility of what philosophy is. You get this internal contrast and critique that you don't get by remaining within one tradition. So I think the question about how do we reimagine the canon, how do we move past uh, this exclusion. Again, I don't think that, I don't think the goal is to define philosophy in a way that gives us a standard for choosing texts that make it to the new canon, right? And that just supplant the old canon. I think it's exactly the way you frame the question, which is that it's a living, breathing thing and it's constantly moving. All I want to add to that is the value of contrast from within. Right, having some outside perspective on your own tradition, because I think it generates a kind of self-awareness that is missing in the Western tradition, and that you can only get that you can only get by taking a leap of faith, right? And by like by jumping into a new tradition and saying, "I'm just going to trust that this is going to be valuable." In the same way, I'm I'm just going to trust that knowing a different language is going to benefit me, not just in terms of my ability to do things I wasn't able to do, but in my understanding of my own language. Speaking of a leap of faith, um, <laughs> um, I had to. Um, <laughs> you, uh, you work on existentialism. I do. And speaking of this double duty contrast, you also work on Mexican, Mexican existentialism. Mm -hmm. Could you maybe explain in your experience of both like the European existentialism and also Mexican, Mexican existentialism, how you see that difference coming about in the philosophies. Right, so one way of putting that is, um, is there a difference between European existentialism and Mexican ex existentialism? And so I, I wanna shy away from saying, saying too strongly that there is. Um, in part because I don't think of existentialism as a school or a movement, um, right? I definitely don't think of it just as, right, like this French post-war uh, school of philosophy. Um, and so I tend to think of it more from my own perspective as a sort of an attitude or stance toward modern philosophy and rationalism and, and, um, and certain ways of thinking about philosophy. Um, that said, I think there are probably large scale or broad brushstroke differences um, that you start to pick up the more you immerse yourself in these different conversations. In the European tradition, and look, again, I really don't like sort of characterizing a whole tradition in sort of these general stereotypical ways, but I do think if you read from Kierkegaard through Sartre and uh, de Beauvoir and, and others, you see on the one hand, um, this emphasis on the contrast 
of the single individual and the anonymous they um, or the masses or even and uh, we're reading in the present age right now Kierkegaard talks about the contrast between the individual and, and a generation right and I think in the Latin American tradition, or specifically in the Mexican tradition, you get a lot more emphasis on the individuality or the originality or the authenticity of a generation, an epic, an age, a nation. Uh, and so I think that will give us really, will give us insights into the nature of cultural identity, thinking about the possibility of the individuality of an entire people, right, a culture. Um, and I don't think you see that as much in the European tradition. Uh, and so I think that is one way in which uh, you start to, to sense differences. I think the other thing too is I think that there are things in the Latin American tradition or the Mexican tradition of existentialism that don't translate well into English. Um, so for example, sosobra is, is a word that you see these, these uh, ex existentialists talk about and I think it has a lot of explanatory power. It's kind of like a species of anxiety, but a very specific one. Um, and I think that it just helps to illuminate, right, the human experience in a way that you don't get by just thinking about the notion of anxiety in this tradition that we typically attribute it to, you know, from Kierkegaard through Heidegger and Sartre and so on. Um, we'll also just get a different sense of what existentialism is. And so in our journal, there's a there's a good article in the first issue about what Mexican philosophy is and the value of Mexican philosophy. And uh, it's by Amy Oliver. And one of the things that she talks about is the need to translate uh, more Mexican philosophy in this case, but you know, philosophy from different traditions. And one of the, and one of the things that she points out is the, about the value of translating is that it'll shine a different light on the traditions or the schools that we think we're already really familiar with. Right now I'm working on a book on Mexican humanism, which I think, or I hope, will help to broaden our notion of what Mexican existentialism is. And part of what we're going to see there is the influence of people like uh, Nikolai Hartman and Max Scheler um, and Henri Bergson, uh, in addition to Sartre, Marlowe, Ponty, and Heidegger, and so on. And I think this aspect of German existentialism via Ortega y Gasset in the Revista de Occidente is, is going to give us a different idea of what existentialism is in Germany, in the Hispanic world, in Mexican philosophy. And I think that's just something that we're not really familiar with. So we're sort of missing a part of the picture um, because we just don't have it in translation, right? And I think this will give us a broader, richer, fuller picture of what existentialism is. Because we do tend to develop these clear-cut narratives, right? So we could pick a book on what existentialism is and we're gonna see the same figures. But it's more complicated and it's richer and there's more, there's more characters to the story. Um, and I think we get that by peering into how different influences arrived in different places like in Mexico in the 30s and 40s. So I think this will be our last question, but I want to return to something you said earlier when you were talking about um, the, the discourse around what is philosophy. And you, you, you mentioned that there was this uh, argument about whether like Nahua philosophy or Aztec philosophy was philosophy. There's an interesting question to me about like form there, form and structure, um, because the what we think of as maybe like a philosophical essay or an argument yeah. is very much tied to the tradition that has we're, we're counting as philosophy. And what might be a form or an argument or a philosophical text might be completely different if we start including or thinking as philosophy much broader. So I'm wondering, this might trouble disciplinary boundaries in an interesting way about how what is philosophy might start broaching into things that we might consider religion, history, literature, poetry. Does philo like where does philosophy go as a discipline? I guess is the question. Well, that's an easy question. Uh, <laughs> where should this uh, 2,500 year old tradition go starting now? Uh, uh, 
I mean, I, I think part of your question is, what is philosophy? And how does philosophy sort of overlap with these other hu humanities or, or sciences or, or human disciplines? Um, and how does exploring other traditions help us to re-envision the future of philosophy? Those are really tough questions. Um, I guess I should start by saying what I don't think philosophy is, right? So um, I'm translating a, a, a paper right now by a Mexican philosopher named Luis Vioro uh, titled Philosophy and Domination. So, and I, this is his view. I think a lot of people have this view. I share this view. I think you could also find it in Kierkegaard. Um, and so the first, the first thought is philosophy is not a science. Right? Philosophers don't contribute to a body of knowledge. Right? So we're not looking for a cache or a store of arguments or theses or isms that we call the history of philosophy. At bottom, philosophy is an activity. It's something we do. It's a skill. It's something that we get better at. Right? And so um, I think that in itself is a fundamental shift. Right? And so then, you, then the question is, well, what does philosophy do? Right? What is the aim of philosophy? And I think at bottom, the fundamental aim of philosophy is to disrupt, right? I think philosophy is a form of disruption, right? I think its, its goal is to make what's familiar uncanny. So in that essay about, by Vioro, he's constantly talking about the way in which the philosopher envisioned what's other, lo otro, right? Otherness, right? And it's sort of abstract or general in the sense of, it's not like just thinking of alternatives, Right? It's thinking of, or it's constantly being in a position of thinking about what else is possible. And I think this takes us back to that sort of general question about justifying our humanity, this notion of accident, accidentality, and this notion of, or the, the idea of the structure of exclusion is part of what we're doing is if we take that all the way and we don't presuppose anything, we're fundamentally back in the position of thinking about what philosophy is and what the value of philosophy is in our lives. Right? So it's a really hard question to ask and, or to answer because um, it's almost like saying, I can't answer it for you because then I would be you the work from the work that you have to do for yourself. And that could be seen as a cop-out, right? Like, uh, I can, I, well, I don't know, so I'm just going to pretend I do know, but I can't tell you, right? But I think this is something that you see in a lot of the great philosophers. I see, I think you see it in the early Platonic dialogues. I think you see it in Kierkegaard, for example, this notion of indirect communication, right? This notion of um, there's this literary quality uh, to the text that is almost fictional in the sense that its goal is to put the reader in the position of having to do the work for themselves. Right? And so I think I say something about this in the essay on, on the canon about Descartes. And I say, you know, look, on the, on the one hand, sure, Descartes offers these theses, but you also have this really careful writer, right, who I think achieves as much through what he doesn't say, right? And he's constantly putting things in a way that force the reader to do the work for themselves, right? His reason leads me to believe. Right. Well, a really perceptive reader would find themselves in the position of asking whether reason leads them to believe it too. Right. And so, um, and I think if you look at these texts, I think you're absolutely right. I think there's a way in which they have a literary quality whose function is not to, uh, again, yeah, I mean, I, I'm repeating myself here, but not to save the the reader from having to occupy the position of accidentality or what Uranga calls the originary position of having to do the hard work for themselves, right? And I think if you think about that, I think it's, I think it's really hard to imagine what that's like. I mean, I think this is what really good philosophers like the Kierkegaards and the Descartes and uh, a lot of these Mexican philosophers that I'm, I'm, I'm pushing uh, try to get us to do is like, what would it be to really fundamentally doubt everything, right? It's much harder to do than you think, right? It's one thing to say like, oh, here's where skepticism leads us and here's the response to skepticism. 
Descartes did the work for us. But what would it be to do that work for ourselves where he says, okay, what if, what if everything I thought I knew could be doubted, right? Um, that's a scary place to be in, and I don't think it's a place that we can stay in long. Um, and so I think you're right in saying that there's this literary quality, but I think that part of what that literary quality is trying to get us to do is to put us in a position of having to question, right, framework assumptions, our worldviews, our religious beliefs, our, I mean, everything, right, from the ground up. Doesn't mean we don't land exactly where we started. It means that, right, in some fundamental way, these beliefs and this, these, this world is our own, right? And I think that's, that's part of what we're doing. Amazing. Thank you um, for sharing your time with us and really letting us glimpse into the things you're thinking through. Right, the chaos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, thank you for this wonderful interview. Yeah. Thank you.